In Acts 6, we see a man by the name of Stephen. So we've gathered here today to look at a life well lived, a man named Stephen who we don't know much about his past, but you know, really our past is not that important. What matters is your future. Is your future in the right place? Are you, do, do you know Christ? And if you do know Christ, are you living for Christ? Are you serving Christ? I mean, if He is important to you, and He was most definitely to Stephen, then everything that Stephen desired to do flowed from that. We saw that in the first part of chapter 6, he was a deacon, which means he was a servant. But the thing that was so special about that was Stephen served out of love. And yes, it is about love. Worship is love. Matter of fact, you can't worship unless you love. But if you love, if you truly love, it will come from it. If you know God and if you see God and if He is important to you, it, 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 all the other things of your past really won't be poor, important, but, but He is important because he's, he's, He is a center of everything. It tells us in verse 8 that Stephen <clears throat> was a man of full of faith and power. Because Stephen lived his life and, and he was fully given to that faith in his life, that he honored God. He trusted. He believed. And not only did he trust and believe, he relied upon, he was looking unto God. So everything in his relationship, God flowed from that. It wasn't what he could see. It was what God could see. It wasn't what he knew. It's what God knew. And when he set up his life like that, when he fully gave himself to God, listen, God fully gave himself to Stephen. God could trust him. No matter what situation he was in, he was all in for Stephen because Stephen was all in for God. So it says in verse 8, he was not only full of faith, but full of power. Not his power. Because when we face things in life, and by the way, we will face some difficult things in life. When we face things in life and we put our faith in God, then all the power of God can be with us as we face those situations. So I don't know what all of them were, but in verse 8 it says, He did great wonders and signs among the people. But everybody knew it wasn't Stephen doing it. It was God doing it. God just used Stephen and whenever you give yourself fully to the Lord and God gives himself fully to you, it, it's natural to a believer, but it's not believable to the world. They don't understand it. So Stephen, because he lived a life like this, people didn't like him. Not all people liked him. Some admired him, looked up to him. They called him to be a, a servant deacon, an ordained position. But others looked at him and said, no, we don't like you very much. It says in verse 9, there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. This is Jews who were dispersed in different places. When they, when they went to uh, Babylon, they were, they were taken to Egypt. They were taken north and other places. Jews throughout all of history have been taken and captivated. And, and they were freed. And when they were these, these people who once were slaves are now freed, they, they were always Jews, no matter where they were, but they came back together. And there was really a synagogue there in Jerusalem where all these, these Jews that had been in other places had come together. And they, could, they had common experiences, so they joined together. And they didn't like him too much. They're, they're from the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, the, those from uh, Sicily and Asia. Uh, Cyrenians, that's... that's what you, today we would say would be northern Africa. That would be west of Egypt. The Alexandrians would be those from the city of Alexander uh, in, in, uh, in Egypt. The, the uh, Cyrenians were from north there. Uh, they, were, they were what we would call today modern Syria and southern uh, Turkey. And then obviously the, um, the others would be the... Uh, uh, Asia. So that's the modern day Turkey and a little bit of Greece. So from all those areas, they came back together and, and they had this little synagogues. And it says in verse nine, they disputed. They were, isn't it, isn't it funny that there's always somebody that wants to argue with you? It, it's not just that, that they're going to let you have your beliefs. They want to have their beliefs, but they want to make sure that you know that their beliefs are right and yours are wrong, so they're going to try to argue with you. But, but it says when 
Stephen spoke to them, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. You know what that means? It was the spirit of God that was on him. What I loved about the girls singing is you could look upon their face and you could tell it meant something to them. That's love. And by the way, that's worship. That's worship. And you and I know when it's real. And you and I know when it's fake. Come on now. God knows when it's real. God knows when you're just going through the motions. When it's just the same old, same old. I, I, I hate to use the word, but it's so descriptive. When it's stale. That's not anybody else's fault, but my fault. Right? If it's in me, if, if, if I'm stale, I'm coming before the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is the God of love who for some reason likes me and loves me and wants to bless me and he's blessed me so very much and I'm so very grateful for it and I want to come and just pour out myself before him. That's worship. But if I, if I, y'all ever been to the refrigerator and found stale milk and you didn't know it was stale? And you poured it out and it kind of, and you weren't sure, and you took a good swig of it. And we all do this. Y'all ready? Some of you are not going to get anything else from my sermon today, but you're going to remember that. Amen. Just understand, I never want to make God do that. In the book of Revelation in chapter 3 and talking about the, the church at Laodicea, he said, I would rather you be hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I never want my worship to make God want to spew me out of his mouth. I want it to be a, a sweet taste unto him. I want it to be nourishing to the, to the Lord of glory. I want my worship to put a smile upon his face. I want him to be, and when he looks at me, to say, well done. I love you, warts and all. I've cleansed you from head to toe. And, and, and I just accept you, and I, I yield my unconditional love to you. Stephen was a guy that knew that and understood that. And, and, and these, these Jews, these freedmen, they didn't like him. They couldn't dispute with him because he had such great wisdom. So what it says there in verse 11, he had these enemies and they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak against, blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law, Moses' law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and, this and change, listen to me now, he's going to change the customs which Moses delivered to us. They had to stir up the people and they lied against him. You ever heard anybody whisper an innuendo? Don't know if it's true or not but they whispered anyway. Well, I don't know, but what I heard, or I don't know, I think, you know, I hate being judged by innuendo. You know, in America, we love the, the saying, we're innocent until proven guilty. Until we hear something and we just immediately believe that they're guilty and they are, they're guilty until proven innocent. And how many times... A fellow Christian, by the way, fellow Christian, because how many sins have you been forgiven of by Jesus Christ? Say it again. And you're grateful for that. Amen. I'm grateful that I've been forgiven of all, but I'm not too sure about you. Because I'm willing to judge you. I hear lies and I hear innuendos and, and I, I, I speculate. God help us not to speculate. God help us to only, you know, Stephen 
was a man full of truth, but when they start hearing all this stuff, and, and he's going to change our customs. He's going to change things. That's a word that nobody in the church likes. Don't change nothing. Right? If it was good enough for Moses, it ought to be good enough for us. You know, can I, can I share a secret? I'm grateful God changed some things in Stephen's life. And I'm grateful that God changed some things in this Stephen's life. And uh, I'm, I'm all good for him changing anything he wants to in my life. Anything in my life that's not in the, in the best light of giving glory and honor to him, he has free reign to change it. Amen? Even if I don't like it. And by the way, that should be the way it should be in the church too. He should have freedom and reign to do anything he wants to do, even if he might change our customs. <gasps> mm. Well, I love verse 15 because it says here in verse 15 that, and all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him. They've been lying against him, innuendos. They've been mean to him, but when they looked at him, they saw his face as the face of of an angel. I wish, you know, we're judged by what we do, our actions, but sometimes we're judged by our reactions. Sometimes when the vice group of life gets put up on us, we're going to find out what's inside. And all these things, he's not trying to get even. He's not trying to get back at him. He's not going, hey, but, 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 that's not true. He's not doing that. You know what? He stood in the very glory of God. And when people looked at him, that's what they saw was the glory of God. So Stephen stepped up and preached a sermon. He was a wonderful preacher. Oh my goodness, he was a wonderful preacher. I'm not going to read his sermon to you. It's in chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 50. And all God's people said, Yeah, I, I, I figured you'd amen that I wasn't going to preach on 50 verses. It's a humdinger of a sermon, and I think you should read it. it, may, it when you read that, that sermon, you'll find out that he was doctrinally true. He, he knew the Word of God. He believed the Word of God. And when he was preaching it, I guarantee you, they were going, Yeah. That's right. Right. Amen. It is true. I mean, I like an amen every now and again. Boy, that was a good chance and y'all missed it. I got a few there at the end. But you know, he was not only a great doctrinally sound preacher, he was a bold preacher. Look in chapter 7, verse 51. He gets through talking about Jesus being in heaven. And he looks at them. He's not, he doesn't care if he offends them or not. You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Woo, he's stepping on toes. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Stiff necked. Hey, y'all look up here. I can even do this. Amen? You know what a stiff-necked person does? <laughs> Their favorite hymn is, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. <laughs> this is who I am. I'm not changing as long as you preach what I like, as fast as I like, we'll get along fine. But don't you step on my toes now. He says your heart hasn't been circumcised. It's hardened. It needs to be cut fresh open so that the great physician can have his will in his way. You resist. There are times when the Holy Spirit will come and He's got those sharp elbows and he'll say, Brian, that's wrong. 
and I feel it. There are times that I want to defend myself. But what I really need to be doing is repenting. Repenting. Repenting means agreeing with God. Seeing it His way. Forgetting our way. We can either repent or we can be rebuked by our loving Father. Because He loves us, He's not going to... He loves us so much, He's not going to let us continue down that way. He's going to help us. He says to him in verse 52, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They, they didn't, when the prophets came and told them the truth, they didn't want to hear it. They killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and the murderers. Oh, now it's starting to hit close to home. Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. God gave you this to bring you closer to him but it's just making you go further and further away. Verse 54, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And instead of repenting, when they felt the conviction, they got angry. The wisest thing we can do when we see any area of our life where it's not to try to explain it away. Not to try to tell God, well, that's not really what I want to do. It's not really that bad. It's not. Sin thrills before it kills. But understand, sin is like cancer. It never wants to remain stagnant. It wants to grow. It wants, to, it wants to metastasize. And you understand that all sin wants to grow to your brain. It wants to control your thinking. It wants, to, it wants to take total control of you. They nasted him with their teeth. But, old Stephen, verse 55, he was full of the Holy Spirit. I told you he loved the Lord and he opened his life up. He worshiped the Lord and the Lord was fully in here. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And while he's in the midst of this trouble, while he, all these people are shouting things against him, he is looking to Jesus. I was in a seminary class and a, and, and a little lady came up to teach us that day for a couple hours. And she walked up and one thing that she knew was that she knew God. And she said, every time I, I, I walk into a room, she said something I, I wasn't comfortable with. She said, every time I walk into a room, I look around to see where Jesus is at. I said, I hadn't done that before. And she said, I want to see what God is doing so I can join him in what he's doing. I want to see where he's at. And I think sometimes in my life, I, I want to take the spiritual temperature of a room. How open are we? Do you feel it? How closed are we? How much are people wanting to share their hearts of love? How many people are just wanting to get through? How many are making out the grocery list? Thinking about what we're going to eat for lunch. Thinking about what's home in the refrigerator. Thinking about how many things we've got to do this afternoon. That meeting on Tuesday morning. The mess that the kids made that we've got to clean up. The bill that's got to be paid tomorrow, but I'm not sure how I'm going to pay it. Or how many of us are just saying, this is a great opportunity to see Christ. This is a great opportunity to be blessed. Like Diane said, I don't want to miss that two hours. I want to take advantage of that moment. I want my heart to be open Lord, I want my eyes to be upon you. I don't want to be distracted. I want to take advantage of this thing called time and let you know that you are the most important thing in all the world. I love nothing as much as I love you. I want my whole being, my life, my soul, my time, my everything to honor you and bring you glory. 
He gazes up into heaven. (laughs) And he saw the glory of God, it says, verse 55. And, And he sees Jesus, but Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. Now, Mark chapter 16 says that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he went to the throne of glory beside the Father and sat down at the right hand of the Father. On the throne of glory, Jesus sat down. My job was finished. But one of his children are going through hardship and Jesus stands up. And when the child looks up for Jesus, he sees him. And he sees Emmanuel, God with us. He sees him watching out. The all-watching, all-powerful, all-knowing eye of God is there. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And instead of saying, Lord, let me see Jesus. No, that's not what they said. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. Every Sunday this year, I've preached this same, use these same words. We God's people are to be in one heart and I'd rather be one accord with God than one accord with the devil. And they were in one accord, but they weren't in accord with the holiness of God, but with evil. Verse 58, they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. They grabbed him, took him out, and started picking up rocks. I used to have a pretty good arm. I got arthritis now. They weren't looking for great big rocks. Can't throw them hard. But you get 15, 20, 30 people picking up rocks, maybe as big as a tennis ball, even ladies picking up smaller ones. Come on. I I don't have the best arm. I might miss, but I know if I get close. Could you imagine running up close to somebody? Pow! Ooh, in the side. Ooh, in the head. See? How cold someone must be. And they hit him, and they hit him, and they hit him, and they hit him. Verse 59 says, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's what Jesus said on the cross. Under thy hands I commit my spirit. Got dogs in the house. Lord, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. Before of them got a really good lick at him, he's knocked to his knees and he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. I love that because you know what? His last phrase was, forgive them. That's love. Loving the ones that are hitting with rocks. That's what the power of God can do in your life. That's what the power of God can do. Oh, a life well lived for God. And Stephen, his life didn't stop. It just stepped over. It says there that his... He fell asleep. That could be mean, fell asleep in death. I'm not just too sure that the Lord didn't allow one of those stocks to knock him out and he didn't have to feel the last of the pain. 
is they kept throwing rocks until they knew he was dead. But to be absent from the body is to be... So he breathed his last breath there, and he saw the most beautiful thing he had ever seen, the glory of God, the face of Christ, welcome home, a life well lived under the Lord.